recording, and I'm joined by my dear friends, the incredible Father Deacon Jagani, and my brother in the faith, uh, Subdeacon Daniel. We're here, we're going to be talking about something I know is very near and dear to all of our hearts. Indeed, it was near and dear to my heart when I became Catholic, and I know it's near and dear to everyone that claims to be an apostolic Christian, and these gentlemen are apostolic Christians, lovers of the faith, that is the Holy Eucharist. But before we dive in, I want to ask you, gentlemen, how y'all are. Father Deacon, how are you? And uh, Subdeacon Daniel, how are you today? I'm doing great. It's always a joy being with both of you. Thank you again, William, for having me. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. No, it's it's always a pleasure having you both on. And by the time this airs, uh, people will be very excited leading up to the show. I'm just thrilled to be able to talk to you all about the Eucharist. One particular um, area where, <laughs> without a doubt, we can say uh, we truly believe that the Holy Eucharist is the body and the blood of Christ. Very different, I want to add, um, very different than uh, than the Protestant way of, uh, you know, you can run into Protestants and say, well, claim, well, we believe in the real presence. They, they don't believe in the real presence because when you begin to unveil the actual theology behind what they believe on it, believe in, excuse me, it amounts to a symbolic kind of presence. And we know that this was something uh, very different within the apostolic churches. Uh, so with that, I'd, you know, I'd like to get the topic started because I, I remember uh, several months ago, maybe close to a year now, when uh, we were, when I was working, and we, actually Father Coppins and myself were working on our book on transubstantiation, um, I asked Subdeacon Daniel, if there was somebody you could recommend to us uh, from to help us from an Oriental Orthodox perspective. And indeed, um, I remember we went through a number of individuals, eventually um, a very near and dear friend to me, in my opinion, the top scholar in Syriac studies, Dr. Brock told me, you got to get with uh, uh, Dr. Amir Harak. Eventually, we became good friends. He wrote a chapter in the book. I'm very proud that we had Eastern Christianity and Oriental Orthodoxy represented in the book. But the point of me bringing it up is because Dr. Harak said, you know, William, uh, even if we may utilize different language, ultimately, we are saying the very same thing. But I want to ask you, gentlemen, first, when it comes to the, the language, transubstantiation. First, I'll ask you, sub, uh, 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 Subdeacon, is that alien kind of language to the Syriac church? Or perhaps you can say, well, that's Latin, but we have our own understanding, but it amounts to pretty much the same thing. Yeah, like you said, William, uh, it wouldn't surprise anyone to know, like we, we don't have that word in our lexicon. Mm -hmm. But like you said, we truly believe very strongly that um, before the prayers, it's just bread and wine. And after the prayers, it's the holy body and blood of, of God himself incarnate, right? So uh, there is indeed a point in the liturgy where that transformation is happening or transubstantiation, like you, you call it. Um, we don't really have a word for that occurring. We can just paint the picture around the reality to explain that it is happening. Yeah. We just don't know what to call it. It's a great, great, uh, particularly uh, particular explanation because it, it does, in my opinion, get to the heart of the issue that before, as multiple many fathers indicate, and I would argue as scripture indicates, before, uh, before it is normal bread and normal wine, then something occurs, a change occurs, and that change does bring about the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, not merely something symbolic. Um, Father Deacon, uh, can perhaps you give your thoughts within Eastern Christianity? Uh, does that term ever get brought up? Or is there something along the lines of, of what we hear in the Latin church of transubstantiation? So the, the term transubstantiation... Um... It's not really something you find in the Eastern tradition. Uh, not that there's anything in it that we disagree with. It's just that the that word itself hinges upon an understanding of accident and substance. You know, a very philosophical understanding of accident and substance. And in the Eastern tradition, uh, that doesn't mean a whole lot. So the term itself doesn't make a great deal of sense. Again, it's nothing we disagree with, mm -hmm. um, but it hinges upon a knowledge of terminology that just is not something we typically use. Uh, with that being said, 
I think, a better term uh, that you find much more so in the East, but also in the Western tradition as well, is the term simply real presence. You know, the Christ is truly present, that he truly is the bread and the wine, the body and blood. Um, that's agreed upon. Uh, in the East, we tend to look at this more as a mystery. We try not to get in too deep into, you know, scientifically or philosophically parsing it. So we typically stay shy of the word transubstantiation, but theologically, we have no big problem with it. It's not an obstacle or anything like that. So the, let me, let me, and I'll, I'll ask both of you all, <clears throat> Uh, uh, subdeacon first, and then uh, perhaps your thoughts, Father Deacon. So theologically, it would be okay, um, Subdeacon Daniel, to ultimately affirm what transubstantiation, excuse me, transubstantiation is saying, that there is a change in the elements, that it truly does become the body and the blood of Christ. Let me ask you this. If that is okay, then uh, is it okay with an Oriental Orthodoxy to logically, it would be okay to worship the Eucharist then, right? Is, is that correct? Right. So in the ecumenical dialogue, which uh, just kind of a, a quick side here, uh, there, there was a big agreement agreed upon by Rome and the Oriental Orthodox a few days ago. They still haven't announced what yeah. it is, but it's like years in the making, apparently. But back to this. So um, it's not one of the issues that is disputed between Rome and the Oriental Orthodox. Yeah. So clearly both sides think that they believe the same thing as each other since they're not arguing over what the doctrine is um uh your question about worshiping the eucharist i would say i don't know if if we've thought about it but in liturgical practice there are many instances in the liturgy where when the priests say it for example like obviously the words of institution and the epiclesis, those are the most um, uh, so, uh, solemn parts of the liturgy where everybody is bowing. And then during the whole time, they, like you can't even look up. Um, and then uh, when the priest turns around to, to commune the faithful, when he brings the chalice, and I think the English word is patin, right? Mm -hmm. yep. when, when he brings them out, he raises them, everybody bows again. And then receiving it, obviously. So this is all, I, you can call it worship, veneration. Yeah. And then at the end, when he holds them up and he tells us, uh, he said, uh, it's, I, I think it comes from the Jewish tradition, like behold um, the face of God or the love of God. Mm -hmm. like Brent Petrie's book, uh, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, a great book. I think it's the best Eucharistic theology book out there right now. Um, so he puts it out and everybody, re although we've communed already, but we reach out to to venerate like this all the people do it at the same time um uh, and uh, when when there are infants who all and i know we'll get to it later who have already had first communion but because it's hard sometimes for infants to commune feasibly so the the priest will just put it on their heads so like the the chalice or the pack in itself will put a place on the, the kid's head and then they'll go so um, everything we do shows veneration slash worship of the Eucharist, but we don't have like a formal devotion like the Latins do of Eucharistic adoration. We don't have a problem with that, um, but we do it kind of in the, the flow of things more so than there's an actual separate thing called Eucharistic adoration. Mm. Very good, very good, um, fantastic there, Father Deacon. Your your uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, as uh, Subdeacon Daniel said, the idea of Eucharistic adoration is a you know, separate kind of paraliturgical action. It isn't something we really do in the East, and th the reason for that is uh, even in the Byzantine tradition. I'm not sure if the Oriental Orthodox do this as well, but we refer to uh, the sacraments as holy mysteries, mm -hmm. and it's you do as well. Yes. And it's it's our uh, our natural inclination to kind of protect and almost shield the mysteries, you know, in a way to, to kind of keep the mystery around them, so to speak, right? So for us, the idea of exposing the Eucharist for adoration isn't something we would do. It just really? goes against our natural inclinations. That being said, I think it's fair to say that in our liturgical life, we do adore the Eucharist in the context right. of the liturgy itself. 
Is it can great? I just add, yeah, can I just definitely. Add something to what Father mm-hmm. Deacon said. Um, definitely. So I, I love that he brought up the idea of veiling the, the mysteries. Every time they're brought out, like to, to face the people, they're always covered. It's n- yeah. There's always a veil on top of the chalice and the patent. It's never open, never cu- uh, showing. And even like taking pictures of it or things like that is not allowed. Um, there's And obviously besides them being in the, the uh, sorry, I don't know the English terms of the, the holy place in the altar. What is it called? The, the tabernacle? Uh, yeah. Okay, tabernacle, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Besides it being hidden there, additionally, there's a curtain that goes over the altar um, to, to have that barrier from the people also. Now, I'd like to get your thoughts. Would, um, be, I, I'm looking at it from my perspective. A lot of, of um, prayerful life of mine was spent before the Holy Eucharist, the Dorian, in adoration. I completely understand uh, both of you, your perspectives. Would you say that perhaps um, if the Holy Eucharist was in a particular place where people could adore it, protected from vandalism, if you will, that it could be uh, something that is acceptable? Or would you all say, look, we don't think it's unacceptable. It's just not part of our tradition. Uh, did you, your thoughts on that, perhaps, Subdeacon? Yeah, yeah. I would say that in any, any again, with the ecumenical dialogue, any, any case of reunion, it's not something that we would have a problem with the Latins doing. We would respect that they do it and, and uh, we wouldn't um, ask them to change anything about that. Um, at the same time, we, we don't feel like our tradition is necessarily lacking in devotions either. Right. Um, with And correct me if I'm wrong, William, from what I understand uh, for the history of the formal practice of Eucharistic adoration in the Latin tradition was that there was a famine in the West. And yeah. because of that, there was a shortage of communion. And so the adoration temporarily replaced receiving communion uh, until that was available again. So yeah. then, yeah, go ahead. And I do believe it comes, in, in all fairness, I do believe it does uh, come rather late in, in history. Um, despite me uh, fully recognizing that I have been benefited of it greatly, on the other side, uh, and then I'd like to get your thoughts, Father Deacon, on the other side, I do know... Uh, horror stories, and they are horror stories for anyone that is an apostolic Christian, a lover of the faith, where people have gone into areas, they've vandalized them, uh, they've stolen uh, the Eucharist, and just really terrible, uh, unfortunate that uh, people have done that before. But I I can see both sides to it, and I can definitely look in early church history, and I don't see Eucharistic adoration at the time of St. Justin the Martyr or St. Ignatius of Antioch or, or what have you. I think it comes later. Um, but I think I, I know a lot of Latin going uh, brothers and sisters that they say, look, uh, a great part of my prayer life is spent at Eucharistic adoration, praying for others. And I see the value of it in, in that particular kind of sense. Perhaps your thoughts on it, Father Deacon, would you, would you say, look, Better to scrap it completely, or would you say, "Look, I, I, you know, it's not so problematic if done in a proper kind of way." Right. So, uh, what I would say is this: Eucharistic adoration has a place mm-hmm. in the Western tradition, and in my opinion, an important place, and it serves a real need. And it's much more possible in the Western tradition than it is in the East, because for a couple of reasons. So, first of all, in the East, we have this sense of all of the sacraments being mysteries, something right. we don't expose, right? Uh, so the idea of Eucharistic exposition in and of itself is something that just goes against our natural inclinations. Again, we don't believe it's wrong in the West. It just it doesn't fit with the Byzantine tradition and also clearly the Orthodox Oriental Orthodox position as well. Yeah. Um, the other thing too, though, there's a matter of practicality. Um, specifically, we use leavened bread for the Eucharist. Yeah, and uh, leavened bread wouldn't fit in a monstrance. Mm-hmm. You'd have to like press it in there. Yep. Um, yep. We'd have to devise some other way to to expose it. Um, maybe you know, a pedestal with glass around it or something. Uh, I don't know, but it just, practically speaking, it, it it creates some difficulties as to how it even would do this. Right. That being said, 
I don't think it's necessary in the East to the same level it is in the West. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So first of all, in the East, there are moments kind of built in in which we in which we comprehend the mystery of the Eucharist. In the Byzantine liturgical tradition, for example, the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom or, or Basil the Great, we have this prayer, right, before we receive communion. You know, this prayer about in which we acknowledge this, this mystery, how we will not reveal this mystery to your enemies. And the whole prayer really kind of centers on the real presence. Mm. And that in of itself is a moment of, of acknowledgement. And throughout the liturgy, you know, the way we respond to the Eucharist, you know, uh, even the bread and wine itself, when it's processed onto the altar, um, there's a sense of something very magnificent, something mystical, something supernatural is happening. Yep. It's really built into the liturgy. So the idea of having a separate thing just to emphasize the real presence or to focus on the real presence um, isn't something we kind of need so much in the East. I think one of the reasons why the practice of Eucharistic adoration has taken off so much in the West was because the way the reforms of Vatican II were implemented in, in some, not all by any means, but in some uh, you know, Roman Catholic dioceses or parishes, the idea of reverence towards the Eucharist kind of dwindled away. Mm -hmm. you, know, you end up with a situation where people don't treat the Eucharist, Eucharist with the same level of respect that traditionally they would have. Right. I mean, maybe you have a congregation with 100 people and you have 20 people giving out communion. Everyone's touching it with their hands. Again, I have no problem with communion being touched by the hands. As a deacon, I always mm -hmm. touch communion with my hands, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying that when, when you have 20 people giving out communion, everyone's mother and grandmother, and everyone's touching it with their hands, um, it could be tempting in some cases to forget that this is something really powerful and magnificent that's meant to be protected. It's tempting to forget that and to treat it as something casual and common. Um, and then one could argue that moments of reverence in the Roman Catholic Mass in some places uh, may have kind of dwindled away and been replaced by entertainment or focus on the people. Um, so for some people, Eucharistic adoration is where they go if they want to, number one, show devotion to the Eucharist and to contemplate the Eucharist being something supernatural, but it's also a place they can go and experience some level of solemnity, maybe even incense if there's benediction. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think in some ways it's a supplement to things that are missing and how the Roman Catholic liturgical reforms were implemented in some places in certain dioceses. I think that's a big part of it too. But the other thing too I want to mention is that theologically, uh, there is a situation in the West in which um, belief in the real presence kind of ruptured. Um, yeah. And that never happened in the East. Uh, yeah. In the East, we never had a situation where people just stopped believing in the real presence. Mm -hmm. Or you have a whole variety of Christianity arising that denies the real presence. We never experienced that. Um, the West did. And a lot of that goes back to the 11th century. I'm sure you're familiar, of course, with the story of uh, Bengar Berengarius of Tours. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. uh, before him, it was common to talk about the Eucharist being a symbol. It was a symbol, but it was a symbol so powerful and made real what it symbolized. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a symbol, but it was also the real presence, both. And he kind of introduced this, this division uh, into theology of symbol versus real presence. Either it's symbolic or it's real, one or the other. Whereas before that, it was both. And I think that rupture in the West, you know, created this environment in which the Eucharistic presence came to be doubted. Because the Eucharist very clearly is a symbol. Even the language in ancient liturgical text talks about as a symbol. And if you look at the definition of symbol today, you know, the dictionary says that a symbol is something that represents something that is not visible to our eyes. Right? Yeah. A symbol is something that represents something that's not visible to our eyes. That's the American Heritage Dictionary. It gives a definition similar to that. Um, obviously, to anyone with common sense, that's what the Eucharist is. It is a symbol. But the problem is when you begin to think that if it's a symbol, it can't be real. That's when you've got the problem. And that dichotomy was introduced in the West. It created this crisis of belief in the real presence. Uh, and Eucharistic adoration is a way of kind of countering that. Again, we never had that experience in the East. I think that, that's a great point there, Father Deacon. I think that um, <clears throat> you can find that kind of language utilized. Uh, you can find it in Tertullian, who calls the Eucharist a figure. Uh, now we recognize Tertullian as a as a great church writer, not church father. Did not um, 
um, make the cut of sainthood, but you find a similar language in, in the great doctor of the church, St. Augustine, who does use that kind of language and all the while believing that it truly is the body and the blood of Christ. I wonder, this does, uh, uh, in, in a bit, perhaps we can talk about, you, you, you brought up a fantastic point of, of the usage of 11 bread for communion. But I'd like to ask you perhaps, uh, uh, Father, De uh, excuse me, Subdeacon Daniel, uh, it, it, you who are so well acquainted with the magnificent uh, Syriac fathers, uh, do any of them uh, show a, a, an emphasis or a great devotion or, or love or particular theological teaching about the Holy Eucharist? If perhaps you're aware of any, I uh, would love to hear that. So uh, going off of uh, what Father Deacon said about symbols and, and reality not, and not having that, that difference not being necessary in the East, and the Syriac tradition continued that way. To this day, one of the many names that we use, Raze or Rose, depending on which uh, dialect you want, it means in Syriac, it means symbols slash mysteries. So um, the symbols were not thought of to be not real. This, uh, and Sebastian Brock, in his uh, introduction on the Hymns of Paradise, he has a section there explaining the ancient Syriac understanding of how symbols may, like, is a, uh, the, the connection of the symbol to the reality. So it's, there was no uh, such difference um, there. Regarding the Eucharist in the Syriac tradition, it's... Uh, <laughs> I, I would say it has like the biggest place. I, I kind of don't know where to start. Um, uh, it's referred to as the, the pearl of great price. It's referred to uh, as the fruit, the, the fruit of the tree of life that Adam was taken away from. You want me to get, can I get into that a little bit, William? With definitely, yes, definitely. So uh, everyone knows the story. Adam and Eve, uh, if they had obeyed God, he would have allowed them to eat of the fruit of the tree of life too. Uh, but because they disobeyed him, so they were barred from the, the fruit of the tree of life. So Ephraim writes, he writes about this a lot in poetry, but one of them says, uh, greatly saddened was the tree of life when Adam was taken away from it, that it shrunk into the ground only to spring up again on Golgotha. And the fruit that hangs from that tree, the tree of life on the cross is Jesus. So that is when we partake of him in the Eucharist, we are partaking of the fruit of the tree of life. And um, even in, when we baptize the baby, I think we're going to get into it later, I think, but you know, William, we commune. The, so we do bapt baptism, chrismation, and communion all together. Uh, so in the, in the communion part of that uh, uh, rite, we are, we tell, one of the things we're chanting is that, um, you are uh, something along the lines of uh, Adam has come back into paradise to eat of the fruit of the tree of life when we're communing the baby because that that the baby is Adam, you know, and when he's baptized, he's been restored to the state of putting on that robe of glory that we were created in. We talked about it last time. I think I was here. Yeah. And uh, and so that fruit that Adam was barred from is being given back to Adam via the Eucharist. And Elizabeth, when we say the Hail Mary, and in, in Luke 1, Elizabeth tells Mary, the fruit of your womb. So uh, this this connection was made by all the Syriac fathers. They're very, um, I always like to view Syriac, the Syriac tradition as like this, this beautiful mosaic of not trying to define things in a legalistic or even philosophical way, but being very poetic and uh, using types and symbols, again, with the word symbols and parallels. Yeah. That, that, that's, that was fantastic. It was great, uh, Subdeacon. Um, and it really does to me, in my opinion, emphasize, if anything, the apostolicity of this incredible teaching of the Holy Eucharist, uh, whereas we may utilize and emphasize different things about the Holy Eucharist, there's no doubt that at the end of the day, we all agree and believe that it is the body 
and the blood of our Lord and Savior Christ. I think that that is, is an important, the most important thing. This did come up earlier, and I, and I, and I know my uh, my Latin uh, church going people, a lot of them don't know this, believe it or not. Um, it was brought up to me just a week ago. I said, I can't wait uh, to do this show uh, because so many are not aware. Somebody told me, they said, William, um, we heard that there are some apostolic churches that use leavened bread for communion. Uh, you know, what uh, What is up with that? Uh, maybe you could touch upon that first, Father Deacon, and then uh, da uh, Subdeacon Daniel. Um, why, I guess the, the, the better question is, why do some apostolic churches use leavened bread for communion? So I'll give you um, a more figurative answer and then a more literal answer, all right? So one of the reasons involved in it is we talk about Christ being risen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the word we use to describe bread that's risen is the same word we use when we talk about Christ being risen. Uh, so just as Christ is risen from the dead, we use bread that is risen. Uh, so there's a symbolism there, right? But the other part of it, too, is um, it seems very likely that somewhere early in Christianity, uh, leavened bread for the Eucharist became the norm, became the norm. You know, there are some who might even argue that at the Last Supper, Jesus broke all the rules and used leavened bread. Uh, we can't know that. We can't know that. It would seem more to make more sense to use unleavened bread following the Passover tradition. But at some point, you know, fairly early on in the first couple of centuries, um, leavened bread became the norm for communion both in West and East. And it was that way in West and East, both uh, probably into like the eighth or ninth century, uh, you start to see the spread of unleavened bread in the West. Uh, and then by the time of, you know, the, the Orthodox Catholic schism of 1054, again, that's a convenient date, not really the begin, the beginning or the end, yeah. you know, the end all and be all. But around that period, this became a subject of great polemics between the West and the East. And the, the Easterners would would oftentimes um, unfairly uh, kind of harass the Latins for their innovation of using unleavened bread for communion because the, the tradition was leavened bread in West and East both for quite a long time. Uh, why that happened, by the way? Why would they be gravitating more towards leavened as opposed to unleavened bread? It could be the struggle in early Christianity between the Christians and the Judaizers. You know, there was this element in Christianity who wanted Christians to be Jewish, and they thought that to become a Christian, you had to accept and follow the Mosaic law. You had to be, you know, a Jew following the law of the Jews. And the early Christians kind of reacted against that. And it's possible that early, at the very beginning, it was unleavened bread being used, but they switched to leavened bread, again, to kind of create a clearer separation between Passover and the Eucharist. In other words, to be Christian is not to be Jewish. It's possible it came from that inclination. So Deacon, uh, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so from my understanding uh, regarding the other languages, I don't know if they have the same distinction regarding this term that the Semitic languages have. So Aramaic and Hebrew, they both do not use the word bread for unleavened bread, like in English, how we're saying unleavened bread, it actually has a name in the Semitic language. If there's a noun for it, it does. It's not just a bread with an adjective. It's an it's a separate word. So, uh, in in Aramaic Syriac, it's fatiro or patira, depending on the dialect. In Hebrew, it's masla. So, um, and the the word for bread in Hebrew and Syriac Aramaic is uh, lahmo or leham or luhma that is bread depending on the dialect so in the in the scriptures when the it, because as you know that the primitive church was very decentralized and they received the tradition and the scriptures in the tongue that, that they were in in the neighborhood you know so whether they were in the the fertile crescent which is uh, greater the, the levant and mesopotamia they're speaking aramaic in their scriptures and the tradition of the, the fathers that they are receiving in their language, it is saying bread here. It's not saying the other noun for meaning the unleavened bread, what would be in English. Um, and because of that, 
the, the, those communities who receive the tradition are receiving it that Christ took bread and broke it, not Christ took the other thing that's unleavened. Um, uh, so then when if, if the argument ever comes up with a Syriac speaker, for them, it's a non-issue. Like, what do you mean? He, it, the, the scripture doesn't say he took fatira. It says he took lahmo. So, um, so then, like, they're making, it's very clear for them. It's very black and white. Or, else, like, they would tell you otherwise. They would say fatira, not lahmo, for example. Um, so there, there's that understanding. Um, and, uh, I, and it's the same occurrence in the Emmaus. Uh, liturgy, I like to call it, when Christ took bread and broke it there in Luke 24. Also in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul talks about the Eucharist. So in all of these instances, there isn't an occurrence for that region of the other word being used instead of bread. And so they have no, no reason to not believe that it was leavened, including all the reasons that Father Deacon mentioned about the symbolic reasons of it being rising because of the also uh, Christ take uh, dying for the sins of the world because the Eucharist is a sacrifice and the yeast symbolizes sin. So he died for our sins. He took our sins upon himself. All of these, the, all of these symbolisms are there. Um, and then there's, again, the, the strongest thing for them is just, well, the scripture is saying it's bread. Now, uh, on that very on that very point, I'd like to uh, to pick it up right on that very point and and, and ask uh, Father Deacon. Um, so, Deacon, you made a fantastic point when you you emphasized what what so many churchgoers maybe either forget or maybe don't know, and that is the fact that within Catholicism, uh, the Holy Eucharist is viewed as a sacrifice. Now, is, is that is that view? consistently found in Eastern Christianity as well, uh, Father Deacon? Uh, yes, yes. Now, some would argue that it, the sacrificial aspect may not be as emphasized as much in the Eastern tradition, and there could be some truth to that, but it's definitely a part of it for sure. Okay. Okay, just perhaps just not emphasized, um, I guess, as strongly as would be emphasized perhaps in the Latin church, but it's still viewed as a sacrifice then. Well, I mean, there all throughout the liturgy itself, there are yeah. places here and there we kind of nod towards it being a sacrifice. I mean, even um, you know, during the prothesis in the Byzantine rite, when we're preparing the the bread, you know, for what's going to take place during the liturgy, there's even mentions of it being, you know, almost like a sacrificial lamb, right? So it's definitely in the theology of the liturgy for sure. Great answer. Uh, so, Deacon, uh, this is a fantastic one. You you, you alluded, alluded to it. So, it, within Oriental Orthodoxy, is, is the Holy Eucharist viewed as a sacrifice? Very much so. I think it's very okay. strongly emphasized. Uh, that okay. it, um, they have pre-liturgical rites where the priests will pick which loaf is the best so that it doesn't have any... Uh, flaws or anything like a, a priest did in the Old Testament with the sheep, you know, and um, uh, it's mentioned like Father Deacon said, it's mentioned throughout the liturgy where we keep calling it a sacrifice and the priest who offers the sacrifice on behalf of the people, we're all facing east in the same direction. He's offering it on behalf of everyone who's behind him, all of us. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's very, one can't kind of see all of these things and not remember the Old Testament and the, the priest sacrificing the lamb, for example. One thing that I, I brought up, and I've brought up multiple times in debate when dialoguing with our evangelical friends, is that when we encounter particular things, um, one thing that I was uh, had a debate a few days ago, and I found strong evidence of the apostolicity of the Dormition of Mary and the fact that all the apostolic churches in their liturgies speak of the Dormition of Mary, the bodily assumption of Mary, the same can be said of the universal belief in all of the apostolic churches of the perpetual virginity of Mary. The same can be said, as we see today, about the Holy Eucharist. Uh, would, you, would you both agree that it must be a strong sign of apostolicity if each and every one of the apostolic churches 
feel so strongly about this particular teaching? Perhaps your thoughts in it first, Father Deacon. Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you look at all the apostolic Christian churches uh, and you see universal agreement on certain points, uh, and then you can trace that agreement back, you know, thousands of years to the early centuries of the church. At that point in time, you're looking at something that, that clearly has some sort of anchoring in the apostles and their teachings. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree. I'd like to get your thoughts on that, uh, Sabdeacon. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think I think that um, it, it's almost like you know those those conspiracies usually by. Uh, our our Muslim friends who they say uh, the Christians all got together, stole all the real Bible manuscripts, corrupted them all, and sent them out again. Yeah. Like it, this is the same thing. Like what did we all get together and kind of hey, let's make this wrong doctrine about communion and then spread it everywhere and then not talk to each other after that. Like it it doesn't make any sense. Like we the the world got smaller. We happened to get in touch again, and we see, oh, well, after all this time, we still have, we still believe in this. Both sides do, you know. It's like, why would we want to agree with each other if we weren't even united? And yet, we still have the same doctrine. That that to me is, is a very very good point, and definitely conspiracy theories from our uh, Muslim friends that. Uh, that they never add up, so we invite them over to Apostolic Christianity <laughs> because they don't—they just don't add up. Uh, one thing that came up earlier, and I greatly appreciated it. It's an area where my Latin-going friends just are sometimes unaware of, and um, it's an area where I am very well aware. Some near and dear friends of mine feel incredibly strong about it, and they'll say, "William, uh, I feel very strong." about infant communion <clears throat> uh, a lot of my latin friends just don't, don't are not aware of it and um they're not aware of infants communion at all and and with that in mind uh, i'd like to perhaps uh go around a different way this time uh, and ask you subdeacon do within the oriental orthodox church uh, is there infant communion and exactly what is that can you perhaps tell the audience what is infant communion because a good chunk of my audience here uh, are, are Catholic Latin going churchgoers, uh, wonderful people, but they'll, they'll say, well, what do you mean? Uh, you know, first communion happens way later. What do you all mean infant communion? Yeah. So there's no separation for us of when the baby is baptized that same day, he's receiving three sacraments. He's receiving baptism, chrismation, and communion all at the same time. Um, and, uh, the chrismation is kind of like, um, pre, mid, and after the baptism. So you can't really separate those two sacraments from each other because it's happening simultaneously, which is a very ancient practice in the Syriac tradition. Dr. Brock writes about it. Yeah. Right after that, the baby is communed. Um, there is no, uh, what's the word? There's no option to kind of postpone that part. It's part of the initiation of the baby into the body of Christ. So. In, uh, like to to prevent him or her from being baptized i mean from uh, receiving communion is excommunicating a baptized infant from the church and he says let the little children come to me mm -hmm. i i asked the, a, uh, a priest once about not communing babies and he said well what happens what happens if something happens to them what how do we know where they're gonna go so from even after baptism Communion is always necessary for salvation, even for a baby. Um, uh, obviously, the amount of communion is, is yeah. not. Uh, so what, what the priest will do is um, he will take like a, a little crumb of the bread and, and wine and he'll put it in a, like a, a spoon of water. And then he'll, he'll like yeah. drink like, yeah, he'll put it in the baby's mouth like this. A very very little bit that's it but it's still communion it's of still course. the real body and blood no doubt um, yeah so we 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 would we would want the latins it's not like mandatory but we would want the latins and we would strongly encourage the latins to bring that back yeah 
And, and I know a lot of Latins that are very open to bringing that back as well, those that are aware of it. Uh, and and I'll, be, I'll confess to the audience, I am very in, in, in favor of it as well. Uh, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Father, Father Deacon. Are you in favor of it? Is there something that you particularly uh, prefer? Or do you say, well, you know what? I am in favor, of it, well, it's in favor of it, William, but I also am a bit sympathetic to the other side. What are your thoughts in general? Well, as somebody who routinely gives communion to infants, yeah, um, I I have no problem with it. You know, my my children, my babies, when they're little babies, they're still my babies. But when one, you know, when they were both infants, they got baptized, and then they were chrismated, they were confirmed, and they received their first communion all at once, all at the same time. And it was a beautiful moment. It was a beautiful moment uh, in my church, in my parishes. We have infants, and they receive communion every Sunday with everybody else. Uh, what we have to understand is that this was actually the universal practice in Christianity for quite a long time. Yep. This shocks people, but infant communion was the norm in the Western Latin church mm -hmm. up through the 13th century. Yeah. Up until that point, that was the norm. I mean, I've seen liturgical texts from the um, 11th and 12th century from the Latin church talking about giving communion to infants. And it specifically describes, you know, the communion of infants, 11th and 12th century liturgical texts. Wow. Uh, the pun uh, one of the one of the pontifical liturgical books from I believe the 11th century, or I think it's the 12th century actually, um, describes the conditions under which infants do receive communion. In other words, they they can't be eating you know any solid foods before receiving communion. Um, so it was the norm in the West. Uh, this is something that the East maintained, and the East and the West kind of moved away from. And one could argue that it moved away from it, not for theological reasons, but for accidental reasons. Yep. There was no moment in which, you know, Catholics of the West sat down and said, boy, we should probably stop giving communion to babies. You know, they're not at the age of reason yet. That never happened. It, it, it fell out of favor because of liturgical reasons. And the main liturgical reason, main accidental reason, was the spreading of various plagues and whatnot. Because when you have an infant, the way the, the, the way the communion is primarily administered to an infant is through the wine. Yeah. And in the West, uh, fears over germs, fears over plagues uh, led to a situation in which in the West, the laity no longer received the wine, only the consecrated bread, the body. Um, so when the laity was cut off from receiving wine in the West, again, through accidents of history, that excommunicated you know, not in the technical sense, but in the literal sense that excommunicated the infants. So th this, this uh, just to be certain for, for the audience to be aware of it, this is rather late. This um, uh, perhaps is a bit of, a, of an innovation. And, and let, me, let me ask you this, uh, Father Deacon, maybe you have some insight into it, and I'd like to get your thoughts on that, Subdeacon. Is there any kind of a movement to perhaps reevaluate this and maybe go back to this... Uh, uh, the giving infants a uh, communion. Are you aware of any chatter, maybe? Uh, I, I've, in, I've encountered many Latin theologians who see the benefit of it. Yeah. And a big part of the issue is this. The arguments against infant communion, the ar arguments against it, are the very same arguments against infant baptism. It's yeah. very hard to advocate infant baptism while simultaneously opposing infant communion. It's not, it's not congruent in the slightest because the arguments are the same for both of those sacraments. Uh, so I've encountered uh, various Latin theologians who've advocated this. I've encountered many Roman Catholics who privately told, told me they feel strongly about bringing back this ancient tradition. Yeah. Um, but I think there's been more of a gradual approach in the West, whereas what they would like to do first is correct the order of the sacraments, because here's what's happened. In the, in the Western church has become ingrained in people's minds. This is how it goes. As a baby, you're baptized. You know, as a seven or eight year old, you receive, you go to confession for the first time. Then you receive the first Eucharist, your first Eucharist at age seven or eight. I think it's seven primarily in the United States. And then, yeah. uh, and then as a teenager, you're confirmed. And that order is ingrained in people's minds as the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And people are resistant against change in their religion. Rightfully yep. so, because let's face it, very often change is not for the better. Very often. So people have a, a conservative tendency, and in their minds, this is the way it was. This is the way it was for them. It was this way for parents, for their grandparents, for their great-grandparents. They don't, they don't 
they're not comfortable with it changing. Um, but there are there's been a movement to restore the order of the sacraments where confirmation comes before First Communion. And a number of Roman Catholic dioceses around the world, uh, I'm not sure the exact number, but a sizable number have in recent decades uh, restored the order. What, what they have now is they're baptized as babies, and then at age seven, they're confirmed, and then they receive First Communion right after their confirmation, usually at the same Mass. Yeah, um, I've actually witnessed this. I've witnessed this at Roman Catholic parishes. And um, I think in the West, there's a movement to do that first, to get the order back. And then maybe once the order is back the way it was originally, uh, it would make sense then to look at moving everything back to the same time. Because originally, you know, baptism, confirmation, and communion all came together as one. There was no separation between baptism and confirmation, actually, until much later in history. They were seen as, you know, as two things that always went together. So what I anticipate happening is if this movement spread in the West to restore the order of sacraments, uh, it probably makes sense for that to happen first, and then later on, they might be moved closer together. Your thoughts, uh, uh, so Deacon, are you, uh, you, do you think that that uh, should happen? Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I think the Latins should do that. Um, I, think, I think that every, every conservative Latin Catholic I know personally wants that to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't know why anybody would be, like, like Father Deacon said, it, the, uh, in my experience too, the arguments against that are, are are exactly the same arguments people use against infant baptism anyway. So it yeah. doesn't make any sense to, to be against it for a conservative Catholic Latin. I, you know, I think that the arguments against it usually aren't theological. I think very often they're emotional. Mm. And from what I've experienced, I can't, I can't generalize, but I've encountered this more times than, than you'd think. I think the arguments against that happening in the West have more to do with the desire for parties and celebrations. Mm. Um, mm. It, the, for many people, the first communion party is a big deal. You know, uh, in, I'm Italian, I'm Italian American. In the Italian American culture, there's a long history of, of big first communion bashes, right? It's a big family event, all the cousins come. I mean, a great example of this is the opening scene of one of the greatest movies ever made, The Godfather Part Two. Yeah. <laughs> it begins with first communion party, doesn't it? And yep. that first communion party rivals the wedding in the first movie. Yeah. Maybe surpasses it in some ways. Um, you know, the first communion parties are a big thing in a lot of cultures. And the idea of, of first communion being wrapped together with baptism, uh, for, for some people, there'd be a loss of, an, of a tradition, not with a capital T, but a lowercase tradition, you know, this big party. And that's an emotional thing for a lot of people. I think that's part of the problem. And we encountered this, by the way, in the uh, Byzantine Catholic churches. Wow. So, you know, historically, when we came into union with Rome, we were exactly like our Orthodox brothers and sisters, you know, the Eastern Orthodox in the Byzantine Rite. And um, uh, the Latin church, the Western church, and Rome in particular, told us to remain Byzantine, keep doing things the way we've always been doing them. Uh, but in some places... Eastern Catholics began mm. to feel self-conscious. We began yep. adopting Latin practices against the wishes of the Pope. Okay. Yeah. We we're actually defying it, It's ironic because we want to show how loyal we were to the Pope. And we showed that by defying the Pope, right? Because yeah. the Pope was telling us to keep our traditions. <laughs> we're like, we, we're loyal to the Pope, so we're throwing down our traditions. Um, and in some places, infant communion went away. And then we were having first communion celebrations at age seven. Yeah. And... You know, there were repeated attempts from Rome to get us to go back to our tradition. And, you know, especially like in the after Vatican II, Rome was very strong in telling us we have to restore infant communion. We have to restore it. And I mean, Rome really was pushing this. God bless them. And our bishops got on board and we restored infant communion all over the place. Uh, so as far as I'm aware, in the United States and throughout most of Europe, Infant communion is the norm in Byzantine Catholic churches. There are some places, though, where there's still resistance, believe it or not. Um, but the problem we had, the main resistance we had was the resistance of people who didn't want to give up the parties. They, so how did we get around that? 
Well, in some places we created this hybrid called um, First Reconciliation. Mm. In some places it's called First Solemn Communion, which I don't really like because every communion is solemn. Yep. But basically what happened is you would go to your first confession and then receive communion after your first confession. And then there was a party over that. So basically we started having first reconciliation parties in some places. Uh, we don't do that in my parish, uh, but some places do this. And it was a way of getting the people on board with restoring infant communion without losing the, the party, which is such a big part of the culture, apparently. It is. <laughs> it really is. Um, and, and really... Uh it's unfortunate a lot of these these people that throw these huge parties um don't tend to be uh loyal churchgoers which is uh, <laughs> something I've uh, got. William, are, well i have to ask though are you questioning the faithfulness of the corleone family <laughs> i mean michael corleone was a devout yeah. catholic you know that i mean maybe. he was the godfather he was the god more catholic than that <laughs> maybe just a little bit um one thing that I emphasize, and, may, and I'd like to get your, your, your thoughts on it, uh, Father Deacon and then Subdeacon, is when we look at, um, and I know this is going to be uh, near and dear to the heart of uh, Subdeacon Daniel, when we look at the magnificent Christology of the great St. Cyril of Alexandria and his incredible defense of the Holy Eucharist, uh, when we look at, uh, number one, his, his very strong condemnations of the the poor Christology of Nestorius, a part of his very, very good and solid defense of Christology, is emphasizing that there truly is a change in it, and, and the elements truly do become the body and the blood of Christ. I, I wonder if, do you, uh, this is just, your, your, I'd like to get your thoughts on it. Do you think that uh, when we look and we examine Christology throughout the ages, the emphasis of St. Ignatius of Antioch, how he desires the bread of God more than anything else um, uh, for food and the blood of Christ for drink. And when we look at this emphasis all throughout history from the greatest Christologists of, 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 of every, every era, the language in scripture, and how when we encounter those that deny that it is truly the body and blood of Christ, it comes from figures with a poor and a low Christology, do we then have a connection in a proper understanding of the Holy Eucharist being tied in with the true identity of who our Lord and Savior truly was, proper Christology, if you will. What are your thoughts on that, Father Deacon? I thought you were addressing it to the subdeacon. Oh, yeah, subdeacon. Then I'll get your thoughts, uh, Father Deacon. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I think that every, from what I know, all of those church fathers who had uh, debates with the Nestorians all brought this up regarding the Eucharist. St. Cyril, St. Severus, St. Philoxenos, all of these, uh, St. Jacob of Suruj, they all mention, well, if you don't believe that the one who was conceived in Mary is God and not another one who God united himself to, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe that he is God, that she's Theotokos, then how does the Eucharist save you? How yeah. how do you, if you don't believe that, because um, in, in one of the disputes against Cyril, one of their sides says to him, um, it is not the one who has life in himself who was crucified, but it is the one um, with the mortal nature who was crucified. Mm -hmm. So then, so that's two ones, that's two, right? So, um, and in all of these cases, it's like, well, how does, they all answer them every time the same question, how does the Eucharist save you if it's not God in the flesh who dies for you? And St. Ephraim, in his commentary on Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, uh, and Cyril, surprisingly, I found out recently, actually, in the last week, I found out Cyril has this reading, which I didn't know existed in the Greek. I thought it was only in the Syriac reading of the verse. Um, the Syriac reading of the verse, uh, the ancient Syriac reading of the verse, according to Dr. Sebastian Brock, Mm -hmm. uh, Hebrews 2 9 currently the version that everyone has it says um, by the grace of God Christ tasted death on behalf of all men something like this the Syriac the ancient Syriac reading of the verse says by his grace God tasted death on behalf of all men 
Uh, and Cyril actually quotes this form too, so it shows me that there were some Greek manuscripts extent to that. Cyril, Cyril was using it, but Ephraim for sure, he does a commentary and that's the, that's the form that he has. So their understanding is that the Eucharist is the Theopaschite sacrifice of God in, in the flesh on behalf of humanity and that's why it saves all of mankind like Saint Athanasius said to uh, in his uh, on the incarnation against Arius he's saying if it's not God who died then how can we have salvation so the Eucharist is that once and for all time sacrifice that uh, that happened on Calgary uh, Calvary 2000 years ago um, who is God in the flesh dying on behalf of everyone. So the Eucharist, like you're saying, it's all about Christology, that it is uh, um, the, the incarnate Son of God who is being sacrificed on behalf of the whole world. To separate would be to make the Eucharist not efficacious. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a very good point. And... Um... I think when we look at the writings and what Nestorius says, uh, it's a great problem when we encounter where he says that Christ says of the bread, it is my body. He says not that the bread is not bread and that his body is not a body, but he has said demonstrably bread and body, which is in the substance, usia. And of course, it, it goes on where there's much more, uh, many more problems that we encounter in, in what, uh, what Nestorius does say. Indeed, really, it, it, for Nestorius, as we know very well, uh, even though today uh, we recognize that you don't have to use the language transubstantiation, you can say transmutation, if you will. But for Nestorius, really, there really is no true change that is taking place in the Eucharist, uh, which really is in, in direct opposition to what those before him in the church were saying. He was in direct opposition to the belief that there was a substantial change in the bread and the wine that was clearly taught by St. Cyril, um, St. Cyril of Jerusalem and, and those before him, which uh, really, it, it raised a lot of problems. And in my opinion, uh, the denial of the Holy Eucharist being the body and blood of Christ, which I, in my opinion, I, I see churches and Protestantism realizing, hey, we've got a problem. We are so far away from apostolic Christianity that now they are trying to evolve their teaching to saying, well, you know, we believe Christ is, he's really present, but then you begin pressing him, you press him, and then they'll eventually say he's really present, not in the Eucharist, but he's beside you as you're partaking communion. Well, uh, that that really is no different, uh, perhaps worse than what Nestorius was saying. I'd like to get your thoughts on that, Father Deacon. That is problematic, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that leaves me to wonder, by the way, um, you know, I'm not an expert on this by any means. The whole mm -hmm. Nestorian controversy is not my strong suit, getting into all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm correct, it seems today that the Assyrian Church of the East has a very strong presence, a strong belief in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. They do. They do. It, it, so they, something um, changed somewhere, apparently. Yeah. My my, uh, my friend Sam uh, notes that they have a very strong emphasis Uh very yeah. odd. They, they seem uh, anti nestorian more than anything else. Uh, yes, uh, yes. Subdeacon, your thoughts? Yeah, just on the Assyrians, real quick. The reason why Father Deacon is because that their their Eucharistic theology not only does it not now depend on Nestorius's, but it never actually did. Uh, mm. It uh, Nestorius was added to the synexarium, if you will, of the Church of the East maybe by the sixth century or sometime late like and people usually like they they like to kind of pinpoint the schism at 431 but that's not what happened um right. yeah it was like at 484 and then theodore was the main guy and then the stories happens later but their their uh uh eucharistic theology comes from before that and they kind of, they clearly didn't incorporate Nestorius, what he said into this. Yep, that's good to know. That's good to know because very often, you know, the Assyrian Church of the East is very much tied to Nestorius, mm. but it seems that historically that really isn't the case. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, historically, it is not the case. Their 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 view and their 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 strong, robust belief in the Holy Eucharist truly being the body and the blood of Christ still is present to this day, which we. Uh, we applaud that, you know, we, we, we definitely, uh, that's something that we, we say aim into. Um, one, uh, one, this has been an incredibly edifying discussion. One particular thing that I know does come up very, uh, very often, people will ask hypotheticals, okay, well, is this possible? Uh, would this be allowed? And, you know, I'd like to go to a subdeacon first to get his thoughts Let's say that you, hypothetical situation, there is a Catholic in a part of the world um, and they cannot attend a Holy Mass at their own church. Uh, is it possible? Or are they allowed to receive the Eucharist in an Oriental Orthodox church? Is that allowed? Uh, is that frowned yeah. down upon? What, what are your thoughts on that? No, no, it's allowed. There's an agreement uh, between uh, the Syriac Orthodox Church of Antioch and the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, not only is it allowed for that, but the the fam that that Catholic family can partake of all the sacraments. Uh, the the ba their babies will be baptized and everything, and they would still count as Catholics, not as a conversion. Like it's like we're pastoring to yeah. them on behalf of the Catholic Church. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Your your thoughts on this, uh, uh, Father Deacon? Uh, beyond just the Oriental Orthodox? Yeah, beyond the Eastern Oriental Orthodox. Orthodox. So would, yeah. that, would that be, uh, yeah, yeah. Is that, is that so nice? from a Catholic perspective, there's no problem with that. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be more likely to find the objection on the part of the Eastern Orthodox. Yeah. Um, what we're typically uh, told is this, respect what the bishop wants. Mm -hmm. Now, Catholic bishops have no problem with Orthodox Christians, either Oriental Orthodox or, you know, Eastern Orthodox or, you know, Assyrian Church of the East. From a Catholic perspective, there's no problem with them coming to our churches and receiving communion. That's yeah. perfectly fine. And as a matter of fact, you know, at, at my parish, we have, uh, there's a an Eastern Orthodox Church, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, not too far away. And sometimes people from there can't go to liturgy and they come to our church and we give them communion and we're yeah. totally fine with that. And honestly, their parish is too. I mean, Ukrainian Orthodox and Ukrainian Catholics are pretty friendly. Uh, but there are some Orthodox bishops who will not allow Catholics to receive communion under any circumstance. Uh, and there are some who oppose it in name, but look the other way when it happens. Mm -hmm. There are some places where it just explicitly happens. You know, it, it, interestingly enough, in the Middle East, for example, where there's a lot of persecution of Christians, um, the line between Catholic and Orthodox becomes pretty blurry because all are all dying together. We're all dying together, exactly. We're all being <laughs> martyred together. And it makes our divisions seem remarkably minuscule in comparison, right? So, I mean, I had a friend from, um, he was from Egypt and the Melkites and the Orthodox, they all, they'd often receive communion at each other's parishes. There was no tension there. You know, people in, it, in Syria was very similar, you know, in situations like that, the schism kind of kind of fades into the background because it's not that important when faced with imminent martyrdom. Um, now, interestingly enough, I have a friend who years back uh, was had to go to Greece for a period of time. He had to work there for about a year because his job brought him there. He was he was Roman Catholic at the time. He later became an Eastern Catholic. Um, but when he went to Greece. Somebody introduced him to the Greek Orthodox bishop of the city he was at. He had a private meeting with the Greek Orthodox bishop in which the bishop gave him permission to receive communion at the Orthodox Divine Liturgy. Wow. So for that whole year he was there, there was no Catholic church anywhere around, right? So he'd go every Sunday to the Orthodox Church to Divine Liturgy, and they gave him communion knowing that he was Catholic. And they were perfectly fine with that because the bishop approved it. Wow. Um, this friend actually became Byzantine Catholic right after that because he just fell so much in love with the East. Yeah. Um, now he's a monk. But, Incredible, wow. Yeah, but, um, uh, you know, really it's up to the bishop. But from a Catholic perspective, there's no problem with that. The Orthodox side might have more of a problem with it, depending on who the bishop is. Yeah. Now, um, we're living in a time where there, there it really does become unfortunate that... Um, the Holy Eucharist, uh, for some people, gets politicized. Um, people will 
really just emphasize the fact that, well, you know what, these people uh, are rotten, they should not be partaking of the Eucharist, and, and that's it's biblical. I mean, if you are uh, in, 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 a, in a poor state of sin within your soul, you should not be partaking of the Eucharist. Uh, but on the flip side, there, there's a huge problem in the world that we're living in right now where you look at uh, the percentage of people that believe that it truly is the body and blood of Christ, and we see that that uh, that belief has has dwindled. It's gone down. Uh, the the last question I'd like to ask you to is, is, what can we do to, in your opinion, to restore the love and appreciation that was once so rampant when it came to going to meal? People would, you know, it was it was an event. It still should be to get ready to go to Mass. If you've got a family, it should be an event to get ready to go to Mass with the family, spend the day in adoration of the Lord. Um, what could be done, in your opinion, to restore that perhaps love and belief in the Eucharist that maybe has been lost um, as time has gone by? I'd like to get your thoughts, perhaps you, uh, Subdeacon, first. From my experience, it's been because we're a diaspora community, I know that in the Roman Catholic Church it's less of a diaspora community than us. Uh, but because we are, I think there's a there's more of a challenge in that the next generation has such a strong disconnect from everything they're coming from because they're American born or whatever, and their parents are coming from over there, and the liturgy is in a language that they don't understand. They don't know what's going on. You know, this the, the very rich symbolism and the length of the, the Syriac Orthodox liturgy and all of these things. And so they have no idea about any of this and they don't know why they should care about it, like you're saying. And then this develops into eventually disbelief in the generations to come. And so from my experience, the a, a way in which to, that could be prevented is to make that like to reconnect those people with everything that they don't know that they have. So in, in the case of the Latins or of the Syriacs, they are coming from such a rich and ancient history and tradition that they have no idea about and they have no idea why it's important for them. So to, to give them kind of the 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 history of mankind to you um uh worldview of this is how everything came about this is where it got to and this is how you received it from all the way from this this line of connection coming down to you who received it say if you're a latin and saint peter established your church in rome and it's coming all the way to you i don't know george in 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 chicago or something um you then are part of that church that saint peter established in rome and all of the martyrs that came from there that came from the west all the way down to you who now are now in america and we suffer martyrdom here in a different way so uh and you kind of have to um not let them it, their their allegiance should be to the church and to where they're from and to um, this line of history rather than to CNN or Fox News. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great, great explanation. Father Deacon, your thoughts. So when we're looking at restoring um, faith in the real presence, I think it's helpful to consider here um, what led to this problem in the first place, once again, which was um, this, you know, 11th century dispute with Berengarius, right? He, the way he, here's the problem he made, the problem he fell into. Like I said, he said that a symbol is the opposite of real. Uh, he created an opposition between the symbolic and the real. But why did he do that? Well, if you look at his reasoning and his line of thought, this all stemmed from one thing. He was trying to understand the Eucharist as a thing completely removed from its context in liturgy. Yeah. So in his mind, he was separating uh, the Eucharist from the liturgy and trying to understand it as an independent thing apart from the liturgical life of the church. And that's what led him into this, this really uh, 
destructive position that if, if it's a symbol, it is not real. And then his opponents, what they did was with good intentions, many of them made it just as bad, if not worse, yeah. by saying, no, it's real, therefore it's not a symbol. <laughs> so they created this opposition between symbol and real, right? And yeah. when, the reason I'm bringing this up is back in, I want to say it was either uh, the end of 2009 or the very beginning of, uh, the end of 2019 or the very beginning of 220, you know, back in the olden days before the pandemic, um, there was this Pew Research poll that came out. You may recall this. And it was a, a, a Pew research, research survey of American Catholics. And the majority said the Eucharist is a symbol. Therefore, it's not real. And people were rightly concerned because there was a widespread denial of the real presence. And when I saw this, I thought to myself, right here, we're seeing the fruit of this. Um, they're denying the real presence. And part of it is, it is a symbol. It is obvious that it's a symbol, that it's something that represents something invisible that cannot be you know, seen and touched. It is a symbol. And because it's so obviously a symbol to people, they go along with the line of thought and say, well, then clearly it's not real. Um, so I, I think the remedy to this is to go back to the error that Berengarius fell into in the first place, which was trying to understand the Eucharist without understanding its liturgical context. I think it's in the liturgy that we find the Eucharist's meaning. It's there. It's spelled out in the liturgy. And everything about the liturgy reinforces this meaning, that it is a symbol, but it's also the real presence, that Christ is truly present. Um, so why is there such a widespread lack of faith in the real presence in the Western church today. Um, I dare say it's because of liturgical abuses or um, unfortunate liturgical practices that are not technically abuses. Yeah. Um, so like I said, in the East, our tendency is to shield the Eucharist as being a mystery. Um, the West, of course, has this tradition of exposition now, which personally, I think in the West serves an important purpose. Mm -hmm. It does help restore faith in the real presence. It does. Uh, I would hate to see it vanish in the West. Yeah. Um, well, but, very, but, the, but the liturgy itself in many places uh, has been reformed in such a way that the sense of sacredness, the sense of mystery has been completely removed from the liturgy. And the Eucharist is no longer seen as a sacred supernatural thing, but as a piece of, you know, a wafer that people just touch and pass around. Mm. And uh, I think that that's 80% of the problem, if not 90% of the problem in the West, along with cultural currents. But for Catholics in the West, they, they can attend Mass every Sunday and maybe not fully understand that something mystical and supernatural is taking place because it's not treated as something powerful or mystical or supernatural. It's treated as a celebration of the people. Uh, and again, I've, I have no problem with the Novus Ordo. I've been to Novus Ordo. Mass is celebrated with beauty and reverence. Oh, yeah. I've seen it done well. It can be done beautifully in a way that brings the mystery, that brings the emphasis on the supernatural. But in a lot of places, it's become like a mundane communion service modeled more after like an evangelical Lutheran church or, or low church, you know, uh, Episcopalian. Um, and it's lost any sense of sacredness and mystery. And I think unless the sense of sacredness and mystery is restored throughout the Latin West, we're not going to see belief in the real presence return. Yeah. And that return to recognizing and, and loving the sacred must return without a doubt. When we were working on our book on Transubstantiation. I remember talking on the phone with Dr. Harak, an incredible Oriental Orthodox scholar, incredible. And I remember him telling me, he said, look, uh, he said, I'm very humbled that you reached out to me to write a chapter. He said, for us, as Subdeacon Daniel said, he said, we have many titles for the Eucharist. One of them harkens back to the great St. Ignatius. He says, where at times we even call the Holy Eucharist the medicine of immortality. And if people recognized that, if they recognized how beautiful and sacred this is in all of the apostolic churches, they would realize what a great joy and beauty it is. And they would get to mass, get to mass, uh, do your best to do it. Uh, gentlemen, uh, brothers, I have had a magnificent time this evening dialoguing with both of you as usual. I, it, it goes without saying I've been beyond edified. Uh, by both of your, uh, you all's presence. Um, I'd like to give you all the opportunity uh, to plug anything you're working on. I know the Subdeacon, you've got a new channel. Hopefully that's going well. Whatever you all want to plug, if you put in anything, any plug you all want to put in, uh, Subdeacon, if you want to go ahead and go first. 
Yeah, thank you, William. Um, so I have the new channel. Uh, I put up a, a, a few episodes, a handful maybe, and then I stopped because uh, my thesis is coming up, uh, my second master's right now. Uh, I am, uh, I did my first submission. Uh, so I got really, and then my wedding's coming up. So I, I got really busy um, with- Getting married. Uh, yeah, yeah, in a couple months. You never told us. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, I'm thrilled. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So that's why the, the episodes uh, stopped because I just haven't had the time. Uh, this one was spontaneous. Thank you again, William, for, for inviting me on. Uh, but they'll they'll come back up again soon. Uh, we'll, we'll have more content. And hopefully you upload this. Remember, anything you do in my channel, anything is always yours. Thank business. you, brother. That means a lot. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Father Deacon, any, anything you want to plug? The floor is yours right now. Sure, sure. Uh, first, congratulations to Subdeacon Daniel. That's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Uh, marriage is such a beautiful step, and my family is one of the greatest blessings of my life, and I'm sure you'll have a similar experience. Thank you. I appreciate it, Father Deacon. Thank you. And um, He's actually Eastern Catholic. She's uh, Chaldean. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. And um, so for me, I plug two things. First, I'm on my website, uh, From East to West, that's East, the number two, west.org, E-A-S-T, the number two, W-E-S-T dot org. Uh, it's a website where I answer questions on Eastern Catholicism. I have an Eastern Catholic fact there, FAQ. And then uh, also I'm still working on a, uh, a project on YouTube called Becoming Byzantine. If you go on YouTube and type in Becoming Byzantine, we're doing a whole series of seminars on uh, Byzantine Catholicism using the Ukrainian Catholic Catechism as our guide. I'm doing that with uh, Father Daniel Dozier, uh, Father Michael Wynn, and uh, Robert Klesko from EWTN. So we've been working on that. We're uploading new videos there all the time, so please check that out. And I will definitely link both of them down here below for the time. By the time this airs, people will be able to click that. If they haven't already, please hit subscribe over there. These gentlemen are doing incredible work. Uh, I, I love the kind of work they're doing. And I've been greatly edified by the, both of your presence, your presence, Subdeacon Daniel and Father Deacon. I look forward to dialoguing with you again. And I would, if you would bless us, Father Deacon, with a closing prayer, I would be so greatly edified if you would be willing to. Sure. Um, what I'm going to say first, though, is I can't actually give a, a, a typical blessing. Uh, one of the differences between East and West, and there are many, many differences, um, is that in the Eastern tradition, deacons cannot give blessings. But in the Western tradition, they can. So that's just, you know, one of those little things that kind of popped up. But I will give a, a, a blessing here. This is a traditional, um, not a blessing, but a prayer. This is a prayer called the Prayer to the Holy Spirit. It's part of our liturgy. So I'll just uh, say that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly King, Advocate, Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere present and fill all things, Treasury of Blessings, Bestower of Life, Come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all that defiles us. And our good one, save our souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father Deacon. I look forward to talking to you again. And Subdeacon Daniel, we look forward to talking to you again. God bless you all this evening. Thank you. Always a joy. Thank you. Thank you.